And hello, movie lovers. So today I actually have director Marshall Tyler for his independent film, his short film, Slow Pulse. This is actually a little short film that's actually going to be probably nominated for the Oscars. And also, too, this film is fantastic. And I can't wait to be talking with him about his film. So without further ado, let's get on with the show. And how you doing, Marshall? Hey, what's up, John? How are you? I'm doing great, man. It's good to have you on here talking about your short film, Slow Pulse. I just want to say, coming right off the bat here, I cried twice. You made me cry twice with this one, man, because <laughs> of how emotional it is. Not only is it emotional, but it's also re very relatable. And then the plot twist at the end that you did. Because here's the thing. We all know Jacob, but we don't know the context of what his father is actually doing. And we don't know how this character is actually related to him or anything until like in the middle of the film. So that's something I really do appreciate, how you pull back the reins a little bit and try to guide the audience into a, a way of actually viewing this film. So I do appreciate that. I so appreciate that. You know, it was, it, it was a big decision to, like, keep that information away from the audience for a period of time and try to make it interesting throughout, you know. And, um, and you know, the whole idea of the story came one day when um, I live in Los Angeles. And I uh, during the shutdown, I had been, like, doing these walks up in the hills with my headphones on and I thought about this idea of this 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 man who was uh, kind of like a fish out of water situation in his dance class amongst these kids and the whole and he was going through all these humiliating situations and the whole reason you continue to watch is the why to try to understand why is he doing this and you come up with your own conclusions your own ideas until the big reveal and so that was the whole concept and, and i'm glad that it hit with you and it struck a chord with you you know um, making you cry twice is the <laughs> it's very rare like i said uh, before this before we were in the green room it's rare for a movie to make me cry twice let alone once and I can't remember the last time when a film actually pulled me on my heartstrings other than maybe 12 Years of Slave or Shawshank uh, Redemption or Schindler's List this movie is very impactful but it's also very inspiring and it'll pull on your heartstrings in the right kind of way and you know it took me back to my years of dance class when I was a kid <laughs> so I used to take dancing when I was a kid. So me looking at this grown adult and I'm looking at these kids, I'm like, what is this guy doing up in here? You know what I mean? Because I'm like, I'm supposed to be feeling some kind of way for this character. I'm like, wait, what's going on here? Okay. I see the flashback. Okay. I see the connectivity with him and that character, but how is that character related? So I definitely like how you did that. And then, you know, when the teacher's teaching him how to dance and train himself, that's something that I really do appreciate with that, you know? You appreciate that because of what? Because of the fact that how realistic it actually is, because of the fact that, you know, as someone that took dancing and things like that, the teacher actually had to teach us and guide us in that kind of same concept. So you have a very realism and realistic way of actually doing it, you know, and that's something that I really do appreciate that you I, did. I appreciate that you brought that up because, you know, um, we consider this film um, to be uh, a film made by and for the community that, you know, we live in. And so you saying that means so much to us because, you know, uh, Tamika Washington, she is a real live dance instructor at the Lulu Washington Dance Theater um, Academy here on <laughs> Crenshaw Boulevard. And, you know, she's not an actress. She was very, like, insecure about doing the role because what she does is she's a choreographer. She's, she's a dance instructor. And so for her to, to do this and, and, and be filmed in that manner and she's portraying the character, even though it's something that she does all the time, I felt like it was going to just bring so much authenticity, which meant so much to me as a storyteller. And what I love to do with actors, especially my stories, is to uh, put them into a world that is as real as it possibly can be around them, you know, with real people that live this life on a day-to-day -day basis, and then have them kind of exist or coexist inside of that space. And so, you know, it was kind of real time what was going on, what we captured in the film of his experience with that class. 
You see, that's what I liked about it was the realism behind it. And I didn't even know that the instructor was actually a real instructor. So I thought that was actually pretty cool. Now they mention it because of the fact that I was not expecting that. And to be honest with you, did with, what was her thoughts when she went on ahead and auditioned for this role? Or how was it presented to her on the <laughs> training for this? Because that's what I want to know, too. Like, how did you present this part to her? It's so funny because we went, we were looking for locations and we were also looking for, for, you know, uh, Jacob. And in doing so, while we were scouting, we had kind of like talked about the possibility of, you know, not only shooting it here, but also shooting it with their students. And, you know, um, I was like, you know what, Tamika, you might actually be perfect for the instructor, you know? And she was like, no, I can't do that. You know, I've never done that. I totally like get bashful in front of a camera and stuff. And so um, I was like, no, but I think you could do it and you bring so much to the part. And so um, it kind of came, we first found the location we, and in finding the location, we also found our instructor and also the class, you know, so it became, ultimately it became this whole kind of like, we can do so much here within what you guys do already. And we can kind of insert our story and our actor inside of what you're doing. And it just worked out perfectly. That's awesome. So she was able to use her class to do the movie basically, right? Or was that a separate? Yeah. That, yeah that's yeah. awesome. That saves you a lot of money and a lot of time for scouting locations because I know lo scouting locations can be hard on people sometimes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we did, we shot this in four days, four to, yeah, four days basically. And so, you know, there were some company moves, you know, because we have these other locations that, of course, but um, but being able to tell that part of the story with actual dancers, with um, the people of this community, it was just such a big joy, such a big satisfaction that I got from being able to um, include, you know, this aspect of South Los Angeles that you don't normally see, you know, and, and this is a real thing that goes on on, on a day-to-day -day basis. These 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 schools exist. These classes exist, and um, I'm glad that we were able to bring our camera and our light uh, and shine it on what they're doing. That's pretty awesome, though. And I also like how you know the main character and the and I like how the instructor keeps saying, "Are you sure you want to do this? <laughs> are you?" Sh and even the uh, the doctors are like, "Are you sure you want to do this?" Yeah. <laughs> and he's like, yes, I have to do this. I'm like, yeah, what does yeah. he have to do? <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, I'm yeah, just the thinking. The question is, what is he doing and why? You know, <laughs> right. Like, the you just understand you're inside of kind of like what he's experiencing is what I was hoping to, to create for the audience is to put you inside of, you know, his angst, his, 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 uh, the way he's feeling about this, being in this, this space that is not his. You know, um, and you know that you know. So it, it factored in so many decisions that I was making about how we were going to tell the story. Um, um, so yeah, and that's not a doctor that was telling him that. That was okay. basically uh, the administrator. Okay, because the way it looked, it, it, I mean, I'm just saying the setup, and it looks like a doctor because I saw the filing. Uh, the file so in his hand. Interesting that you say that now, because I can see now why you would say that. <laughs> right, because I wasn't thinking. Because that's how you knew that you fooled me, though. Because I'm thinking as a doctor that's telling him, "Are you sure you want to do this?" And then you have the uh, the teacher of that of this class is saying, "Are you sure you want to do this?" So I'm like, "Okay, is this guy's health in, in trouble? What's going <laughs> on here?" So my mind was going all over the place, which is really interesting because of the fact that you were able to show the file. And I think if you had actually went full on in and say, "Look, this is a school, and this is a guidance counselor. This is someone that's trying to look out for the kids and the the kids' best interest." I think I don't think it would have actually pulled the, the veil over people's eyes as much if you I went on it yeah. and did that. So well, I definitely it's like good it. That it's left so vague that you don't know what it is, and you come up with your own conclusions. So exactly that, that you saw it that way. That's that's one of the things I love about director about your directing and certain other directors is the fact that you allow the audience to think for themselves rather than go ahead and say, "Hey, look, this is what it is, and that's it." No, I, I want to. I don't want to be taught 
anything when I'm going to see a movie. You know what I mean? Because I've seen these some directors where they're like, oh, this is happening because of this, and then I'm actually explaining it. I said, no, I want to experience it for myself, and let me draw out my own conclusions on what I think I saw. And then if you later on in the film, you can pull back that deal and show me what I was missing. And that's something that I really have to say that I liked about your film was the fact that I was able to you pull back that veil. And once that veil is lifted, I knew what you were going for. And, I'm, and it's actually cohesive. It's something that makes sense. It's beautiful and meaningful. Thank you. You know, that means so much to me. Um, uh, all your compliments mean so much to me. I really appreciate it. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, you know, you know, it was an, an issue of just restricting the information to for as long as possible, and um, and keeping the audience engaged in an interesting way, and um, and and uh, yeah, yeah, and <laughs> I was thinking, what else was but I kind of got lost. But yeah, that's basically, cool. you know, um, the fact that it touched you, the fact that it, it it hits home on so many levels is just really just. Uh, so amazing to me. I just really love hearing all that. You're very welcome. And even my co-host Rossi, she says that she agrees as well because she saw the film as well. Oh, uh, thank you, Rossi. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, another thing that was interesting to me was the monologue. At, because of of course I'm thinking, okay, did this guy trip over his feet? What's going on here? He's on a roll. I'm over there cheering him on. Then all of a sudden. He, he, he falls down like he's going to have a breather. And that's what I think it was. It was a breather for him. And then he just gets back up and explains his situation through the monologue. And through the monologue alone is, is beautiful writing. Because now you actually have a cohesiveness of what's going on with Jacob and why he's dancing. And I loved it, man. Like, for real. This was beautifully well done on that. Thank you so much. Yeah, that monologue is just so important because now you're allowing the audience to come into his what's going on inside of him and understanding his motivations and and why he's doing it and he feels that he's failed so dramatically and so it becomes even more devastating when you understand why and so um yeah i'm glad that that it, it moved you um you know which you know it moves me every time I watch it. It moves of uh, clearly the actor Jimmy Fails, who did a beautiful job. He does of conveying his um, heartbreak in that moment because he felt like he failed, and it meant everything to him to succeed, which is why he was putting himself through so much, you know, to make this thing be meaningful and to make this this without telling too much more about the story, but, you know, to do his part in this story. And, and that whole monologue took on a whole different meaning, you know, especially for Jimmy, who said the same thing when he read it. And um, one of the, we had to literally clear people out of the space for him to do his monologue. He just wanted to have the place empty, just wanted to be in his head and, um, he did such a fantastic job, you know. He, it works. He fails is, I don't know if you've seen the film The Last Black Man of San Francisco. In no, San Francisco. But, but now I want to. Yeah. <laughs> so. it's, um, it's, it was at Sundance in 2018 or 2019. Um, and uh, it's just a, a beautiful film. And, and there are a few actors that have what... Jimmy Fells has in Aces. You know, he is able to be so empathetic just with his facial expressions, with his eyes alone. You know, this is a role that we, that has very little dialogue. So everything had to be conveyed through his emotions, through his mannerisms, through his body movement, you know, and, um, and what made him so perfect for this was that he does that just without even trying. You know, that's just how he communicates with the world. You know, there's an, you know, there, of course there's, you know, the live and, you know, wild Jimmy, but there's the other, the, the actor in him is, is this, this quiet species that I just absolutely love to watch, you know? And so um, the film would not have been as effective um, 
without his brilliance, in my opinion, um, because the film literally is eight minutes and 46 seconds in the actual running time from the first frame to the to when you say, you know, a Marshall Tyler from, I can't remember what the first credit is at the end, but all of that is 846. And it's 846 for a reason, because this was a commissioned film. Um, it was commissioned by Procter & Gamble. And um, the objective was, um, we were to tell a story in eight minutes and 46 seconds, which was the original time that uh, the murderer, Derek Chauvin, was on George Floyd's neck in Minneapolis. And so the concept was to take that time, reclaim it, and tell a story of hope and um, of love and, and taking that time and making it mean something else. Man, and, you're making me almost cry over here, dude. Like, for <laughs> real. And, and this, but seriously, man, like, Here's the thing. I like the I like that beautifulness of that, where it's like it's really about soul searching in a sense of using something that's dark and illuminating that darkness with some light for the eight minutes and forty six seconds because of the events that happened with George Floyd, and then you have this beautiful piece, and it just I lands wait, well. I just <laughs> that to me. It gets me on every level. It gets it, me it does. Yeah. Um. Before we start again, but Frank Clark says you're an awesome director, and Rossi says we will have to che- yes we will have to check out that um, check out the film that you just mentioned as well. But what's dude, up, Frank? <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, man, like that's just beautiful writing. Whenever you're using something that's so dark and you're telling a story of lightheartedness and giving a guy some hope in his life. This character, you're giving him some hope yeah. of for his son and doing what he's doing for his son. Yeah. Well, you know, I love stories that can convey hope in an authentic way. You know, it, you know, um, and that's so important in terms of when we can cons- we consume so much stuff these days. You know what I mean? And it's it's good to find those little nuggets that you know that shine a light in you that that helps bring your own light out you know because that's what i hope this story does i hope this film is able to connect with people in a way where you know you you know it is a dark story there's there's darkness there but on the other side of that darkness is the light and that's what this story overall is about you know finding that light fighting for that light and doing whatever you can to maintain and keep it intact because life you know throws a lot of curveballs our way it does you know and that's what this story is about you know and dealing with life on life's own terms and and making it into whatever you can by your sheer force exactly because i feel like in today's world and today today's society the world is so dark it needs some illuminating and i think your film is actually perfect for that and you know, especially how media just dis- t- takes everything, and we're like I said, we're absorbed by so much stuff, where it becomes like, okay, you know, is this world, does this world have any lightness, or is this all dark because of the way the media depicts it? You know what I mean? It's like we need some lightness in that. I feel like we need your we need film all, all the time, you know, because so many people go through so many hardships in life, you know. And which was why it was important for me to tell this story and have him be mm-hmm. Bernard be a person that that works at the liquor store because you never see if you've ever been to a liquor store. I don't know if you I have. have or, I don't even I know. Have. Hey, I'm are. from Boston, so yeah, I'm, I've been to a liquor store. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, you have bodegas and what do you guys call them out in, in Boston? A pocky. A pocky. Yeah, a pocky. <laughs> yeah, you know, well, you go into a pocky and you never hear you know, or see what's going on in that person's life. Do you know what I mean? And so I felt like it was a great opportunity to tell someone else's story, you know, within this story to show like, wow, you know, you know, everyone's life matters. And, and like you said, there is so much darkness and it's so great to be able to have a story where a person who is somebody at a liquor store, somebody, you know, the average person exactly to be able to be 
to have a spotlight on them and and be able to tell this story of devotion and love in such a beautiful way. So um, that really means a lot to me because, you know, I want that part of the story to really resonate with the audience. The fact that, you know, this is here to, it's, I want to uplift, but I, you know, I also want to tell the truth at the same time. And exactly, there's so much truth in this particular story. Also, I just want to shout out my boy, uh, Frank, he's on here and he, <laughs> he's, you know, a psychologist and, and somebody that um, helps me navigate some of these emotional spaces you know i always consult with him before i um do a film and i talk to him about what is this actual process like for somebody experiencing this um firsthand and which is another reason why it might resonate with so many people because it's actually based in the actual experience of what somebody goes through so frank was able to talk with with jimmy you know have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with them talk to him about what this grieving process is like to go through what this whole entirety of, of dealing with some kind of this kind of trauma and um so that the fact that he's on here i just want to shout him out dr frank clark you know to say what's up because so many wonderful people have come together to to tell this story um and frank is one of them so it all matters it all you know you know adds up to the end result exactly and okay so now we talked about that and not only that but i want to say this i think that it, it was actually needed for him to get into that space of basically being by himself to get in that headspace and so the way it's just him on the stage and this, there's this quietness amongst the crowd and that's what i like about it because here's here's why i like it and it's the fact that we're as an audience is watching him on stage so him doing that monologue he's using us as the audience to pull us in to what he's feeling is to reel us in and that's what i feel like he's doing that's and bringing so it into deep. his world that's so deep and he doesn't know how people are going to respond to him you know so all he's consumed with is the fact that he failed you know and then the audience like you bring him back to where he needs to be so um makes it all worthwhile most definitely so now here's the number here's the number one question because I've been searching all day long for this song that you had on this on this movie, and I tried iTunes, I tried YouTube, I Googled the <laughs> course, I did everything I could possibly can to get my hands on this thing because of the fact I love the energy, I love the vibe. This puts you in a good mood. When I'm when I'm go here's the thing: as I'm commuting through work, I I try to find stuff that actually makes me happy and get me motivated. Either I'm using an Eminem song, or I'm using hip hop or something to actually get me motivated for work. And this song to me is the song that I need in the morning time when I'm drinking coffee and going to work because it just puts you in a joyful mood, dude. I'm, I'm serious. You did a good job picking that song out. Thank you. Uh, you know, it's so funny. We went to um, Vicki Hyatt, who is a music supervisor on a lot of big films. And, you know, it wasn't the song that we were originally trying to go with. We had a song that was a little more popular. Do you know what I mean? But this is a small indie production and we couldn't get it clear. So right. Um, Basically, if you get a song like that to clear, you need at least 20 grand to 40 grand exactly. just to clear it. Exactly. And that's a, it's crazy because I'm just using this as an example. I don't mean to cut you off or anything, oh. but my first show was The Sopranos. So with The Sopranos, they would have to go ahead and use different music for the strip club scene. And basically the girls would go on ahead, dance to nothing, or they would wind up dancing to something that wasn't part of it. Just so the way if they couldn't get the song, they would have to use something else to implement that song, that the way they're dancing. Right. So, so basically it's like, it's just an awkward dance or whatever. So I understand what you're saying though, because it costs about 20 to 40 grand. If that, if you're, if it's a Rolling Stone song, you're probably thinking of about 150,000 or more, yeah. for example, or whatever you're trying to use. But I like the fact that you went with a small indie uh, person because of the fact it gets that person known and out there. And also too, you're also trying to get yourself out there. So you're actually helping them build as I there is. 
Well, you know what's so funny? So, so Vicky Hyatt, she's her. She's you can you can Google her, Google her, and she's like or IMDb her, and she's like a fucking phenomenon. Excuse me. Like, <laughs> no, 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 you're good. <laughs> and she's just an amazing music supervisor. And so she gave me some some options, and we were like down to the last one, like, what are we gonna do? What are we gonna do? And I really liked the lyrics of what he was saying. Is the artist's name is is Red Parker. And I loved what his sentiment was. And then I was like, but the beat was going too slow. And when we recorded, we had a playback track that it, the, the timing was a little bit faster. So what I did, I have my, my boy, Matt Parker, in, um, in Canada, actually, in Windsor, Canada. I'm sorry, Matt Barker, in Windsor, Canada. And Barker Music, this, this kid, is so genius. All he does all day is like mixes songs and like comes up with beats and stuff like that. And so I sent it to him. I sent him the original song that we had um, Jimmy dance to. And then I sent him the track that we can clear. And I said, can you please come up with something in the middle? And so what you're hearing is what you know, we took the original track and remixed it so that it would have the feel that you're feeling right now, experiencing right now. So it's so interesting. If I were to play you the original track, which is great on its own, you know, but what Matt Barker did, Matt was able to like make it sound like something you could actually hear on the radio, make it, not that it wasn't like that, but just saying that it made it more into in the timing of what we needed for this particular performance. Right, because of the fact that you need to actually have it to where it actually explains the character's excitement. And also, too, it, the way that he moves and the way that he's dancing and that excitement. So you want to actually feel that, make the crowd feel that same experience as he does. So that that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Because I I did that for a monologue I did in theater class in high school where I basically used Foo Fighters for a boxing scene. <laughs> I did. So I totally understand. Yeah. So because here's the thing, I want people to get the idea of what I'm doing. So therefore I try to use songs to and to, you know, basically explain where the character comes from. And I think that you do a good job not only ex feeling the excitement on the stage and and stuff like that, but also feel like that you also explained who that character is on stage. Also, to explains what kind of music his son actually likes, even though his son's not up there, his soul is up there because his dad's dancing up there. Which is what I meant by you know a song that you would hear on the radio is that mm -hmm. something that his son would be listening to that it had to feel right. like you know like oh, okay yeah I would rock to that you know so if I was a nine-year-old kid, you know, so. Right. Uh, <laughs> uh, you see, so. there's only like one song that comes to my mind is the Post Malone song from that Spider-Man movie, uh, Sunflowers. That oh, was like Sunflowers, the only. That was the great one, yeah. That's a yeah. Great one, yeah. So, you know, yeah. the song that we actually were doing this to, it was a Jungle song. Have you ever heard the group Jungle from the UK? No, I haven't heard them. Um, I want to say it's by Jungle. I could play it for if you want. Uh, we can do like a little small clip real quick and do that, do it that way, so that way I'm not getting a copyright. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me see. What was, uh, I always have a like playlist of songs when I'm writing and when I'm doing a song. I mean, doing a, a film, and this one was. Again, it was by Jungle. It wasn't happening there. Okay, I'll play it just a little bit of it, okay? Okay. Okay. I like that. Okay, I have a little bit of a Philly vibe from that a little bit. Like a, I can I can picture maybe like Philly, New York kind of vibe going with that. Yeah, I can. I, I, I'm like cool sound. Jungle has a real cool sound, and you know, it it sounds like 
I don't know, like this, it's a real aggressive masculine voice, but that also is kind of tender at the same time. And, and so I love that whole sentiment of what that, but that song, like you hear how the, that's how the, I don't know if you saw the, you know, the dance, that's where, it yeah. came from, where that song started. <laughs> <laughs> but dude it's, it was a fantastic film it still sticks with you even after you watch it and stuff like that and that's something that that's rare for me though too is there's very few films that still stick with me and one of them being was a short film that i reviewed last year and then there's your film that i'm that i reviewed this year so i would have to say like there's like three films in the top tier right now that that still sticks with me and your film is one of them and then the other one from last year and then there's one more so you definitely have my attention whenever it comes down to your directing your stylization and your writing and Thank you know you so if you ever need but dude if you ever have anything else that you want to send in to me feel free to email me because I'll seriously for me, man. <laughs> because seriously i want to check out more of your stuff because you're, you're just that talented Thank that you. i just want to go through your filmography and just check out everything that you put out I so appreciate that, man. Just not like just to tell you that this is my third short, but it's also our third short that qualifies for the Oscars. So it's like our first one, Night Shift, premiered at Sundance and uh, did really well at Chicago International. And then our second one, uh, Cap, uh, uh, was acquired by HBO, um, also Ooh. qualified for the Oscar after a win at Urban World. And uh, and this one, Slow Post, you know, is our third Oscar qualifying film. So we're hoping this one is the one that we can get the attention and that we can get the word out that we're making really great quality, strong, solid films and that need to be seen and embraced by an audience. And so you helping us bring that, that message to the, the people is so appreciative. We're very appreciative. You're very one, welcome. That it, that it that it touched you in such a way, but also that you invited us to be on your platform and, and, and okay. help spread the word. You're welcome, man, because seriously, you deserve it. And as soon as this thing got sent into me, I'm like, yeah, I need to have him on. I need to ask him some questions because I have <laughs> questions. And, you know, I, I'm actually happy that you're, you have three films in the can that you've done that's been nominated. And then also, too, on well, HBO. That have been Oscar qualified. Oscar qualified. Okay, well, still, it's, it's still a huge deal, though. Yeah, it's still I mean, a huge thing. You have to win a festival. There's only right. like 90 festivals, I think, around the world, you know, that mm -hmm. you can win that okay. will allow you to qualify. You know, I gotcha. So, yeah. But still, I'm just happy that it's qualified and it definitely deserves it. And how is it doing in, in the uh, film festivals and stuff like that? Uh, were you in the Holly Shorts Film Festival or anything like oh, that? we weren't in Holly Shorts, and I wish we were. I don't know why we weren't, but um, I've never played that festival, strangely enough, and, and I want to. Um, but, uh, no, we premiered at Tribeca. This film premiered at Tribeca, and, you know, We've done, uh, right now, we literally just found out that we are nominated for the African Academy Award for Best Diaspora uh, Short Film. So, Congratulations you know, to you. Yeah, we have done a little run and it's been great and it's been impactful. And, um, and we're just so excited to be at this place where we are right now. We also just played at this festival here in Los Angeles called the Oscar Michelle Festival, which also it happened to have won the best narrative short there as well. So we're doing pretty good, you know, coming out the gate, you know. <laughs> That's great, man. Um, so before we actually wrap up, I have a little question for you. And this is something that I try to work into some of my interviews. But my question is this. What is your spirit animal and why? My spirit animal? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> Oh, no, like you're making me think. Um, you know, I am, I think my spirit animal, I don't know, I would say an owl. Okay. Is that say. because you're up all night editing or is it? <laughs> yeah, well, I am pretty much up all night, you know, um, in the wee hours. And, um, Owls are just so intelligent. And not to say that I'm Mr. Intelligent, but they they have this wisdom about them that I really admire. 
but there's also a fierceness, a ferocity. Ferocity, is that how you say it? Ferocity. Ferocity. There you a go. ferocity <laughs> about them, I'm sorry. A ferocity about them that is uh, deadly. And so I like that combination that you have to watch out for owls because they'll sit back and you won't know when all of a sudden when they come, they come, you know. And so <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting, though. I like I like that concept, man, because I never heard anyone on the show that says that they think of them as an owl. So I thought that was actually that's actually pretty cool. I like that. <laughs> but you, you know, they are full of that, so I don't know. <laughs> well, here's the thing, though. Look at Winnie the Pooh with the owl. I mean, that's that's gotta say something, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Have you seen that new Dark Willy, Winnie the Pooh? No, I haven't, but it's on my radar just to check out because here's the thing. I like over-the-top cheesy films as long as I know that it's going to be over-the-top and cheesy and not something that I'm expecting to be serious. Like, the closest thing that I could say that I, I liked that was over-the-top and cheesy was the Nicolas Cage movie, and it's called Willy's Wonderland, where he's actually taking down puppets, animatronic puppets that kill people in a chunk, horror, chunky cheese kind of place. That sounds kind of awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me. It, it, I was like, you like this? I was like, yeah. Because you must have been a stoner in a later life. I said, no, I don't even smoke. <laughs> I was like, I was I like, this like Nick Cage's last film, The uh, Bearable uh, Something Talent. Or... I need to see that, to be honest that with you. pretty damn good. So are you watching anything currently? Are you watching any movies, TV shows, or anything like that? Uh, you know, um, Aside, you know, I, I don't know if you know, but I just basically do. I ba I directed two episodes of this series called City on a Hill with Kevin Bacon. Oh, congratulations. And, um, yeah, so episode 303 and 304. So, you know, the conclusion, the series ended uh, on Sunday. So I've been like catching up on that, you know, just what was after my episodes. And, right. Um, and, uh, uh, been just recently just working on my own script right now and um, working towards getting my first feature made my yeah so um, but there's so much stuff that I, I consume on it you know I've been watching a lot of Chloe Zhao stuff I, I rewatched the writer I rewatched songs my brother taught me um, just recently um, uh, Yeah, there's a lot, to be honest with you. I'm a big Dardenne Brothers fan. And they're filmmakers from Belgium who I am absolutely bananas for. And so I, anytime I get a chance, I always watch their films. Whenever I'm like, mm, let me see what it was. <laughs> and they're like kind of dark too, you know, but um, I love like just watching and being in, in that space with them as filmmakers. Right. Yeah, I'm actually, here's the thing, with the streaming services nowadays, it's a lot to absorb, so you're like, okay, there's too many TV shows that caught my, that will catch your interest, it's like, ah, do I have time to invest my time in this TV show, especially with all these other streaming services and what they offer, but, there's but here's so much the, out there, and yeah. you know, I, I came up under Michael Mann, and so Michael is my one, is my great mentor and somebody whose work I admire, and I don't know if you know, um, his films, which are Heat and The Insider and Ali and uh, Collateral, et cetera, et cetera. And he's That's doing, my favorite. Yeah, Collateral is just amazing. And he's doing a film now um, in Italy about uh, Ferrari, and I just cannot wait for that. Um, so, yeah, I there's so much out there, but it's always about trying to find the good stuff that's worth your time. And um, So, yeah, I'm always excited to come across that kind of material. Same here. Like right now, I'm watching, uh, I'm rewatching Breaking Bad with my fiance. <laughs> and then I'm going for Breaking Bad. That's on the weekends. Breaking Bad is on the weekends. And then after that, on Wednesday nights, I actually do a Game of Thrones, House of the Dragon spinoff show. I heard House of the Dragon is so good. Um, it is. I, I don't know how it is now, but I was involved. I was definitely invested into the uh, into the setup. So I have to watch the other one that just aired Sunday. But I am definitely invested into it. What about it's, the bear? Have you seen the bear? No, I haven't. On FX, that's pretty intense. That's pretty good. Yeah. I'm gonna have to check that out. This last season of Atlanta was just amazing. Like 
I don't know if you got a chance to see that yet, but no, nah, I haven't. There's like a lot of stuff that I still need to catch up on because basically 99.9% of the time I'm always editing my podcast and stuff like that. So therefore it's like, did you catch this up? I was like, dude, I wish I had a lot of time like you do, but I don't have that much time. I'm also trying to plan a wedding and everything else. So it's actually, that's also, thank you, man. Thank you. But yeah. Um, Frank also said, appreciate you. Of course, Frank. <laughs> <laughs> but man, I just want to say this. It was an honor or a privilege to be able to have you on here talking about your short film. And you guys are going to, you're three for three, in my opinion. Something's going to land. Something's going to stick somewhere to where I'm going to actually get to see you at the Oscars one day. <laughs> and, you know, after this show is over, stick around in the green room because there's something I want to tell you as well. Most definitely. Because, um, because I did a little something before we actually started the uh, show, and I want to bring that light to you. So, awesome, man. Yeah. Okay. Now you got me like, wait, what? what? You see? That's what I do here. That's what I do. But <laughs> All right, Obama. <laughs> I'm bringing, bringing to the people. But yeah. Uh, so anyways, dude, it's it's been an honor. I hope that I wish you a lot of success with this film. This movie has legs. It, you're very welcome. And matter of fact, I even have a matter of fact, it's actually on YouTube for people to watch. So what I did was I copied the I actually copied the link into the review that I did. So that way other people can watch it and experience it and not Amazing. just watch the clip outs. Amazing. So I also just want to shout out Zion Rupert, who is the, who plays Jacob, who was a, a kid that we searched high and low for to find. And he actually lives this life. You know, his whole thing is dance. That's all he's interested in doing. And this father is a single father who is a devoted father who is raising three boys and helping them pursue their dreams. And it's the most beautiful thing to see. So I just want to thank, uh, you know, shout out to, to Zion. Also the Debbie Allen um, Dance Academy who helped us find Zion. Um, and of course the Lulu Washington Dance Academy. And Procter and Gamble, 846, we wouldn't be here without them. So we're so grateful. Tribeca, everybody, we are so happy to be in this space and we're so glad that this film is resonating with you. And we're again, thank you so much for bringing it um, onto your platform and telling people about it. You're welcome, man. It's it, like, I, like I said before, this movie will stick with you. This movie will pull on your heartstrings. This movie will make you question what the character is doing. The movie is called Slow Pulse. This movie is fantastic. Check, it, check out my non-spoiler review for this film. And I'll have that link in the description later on for people to check out. Also, too, I also have a link to to the film as well for people to check out as well. Because everybody's like, here's the thing. I do these short film reviews. It's like, well, when's the movie coming out? I don't know. But as soon as I find out something, I'll let you guys know. I'll let you guys know in the comments section. So it's good to actually have a link to where I can bring people to so that way they can watch it and experience it for themselves. So, you know, I, I do appreciate you doing that for other people that want to view your film for the very first time. Of so, but that, but that being said, that's going to be it for tonight. Don't forget, 8 o'clock Central Time, 9 o'clock Eastern Time, I will have my episode 6 review of House of the Dragon. And that episode is for the spoiler review of The Princess and the Queen. That's actually the name of the episode that I'm reviewing. And then, of course, we have, of course, on Fridays, we also do our She Hulk review. But what we're doing is we're combining both episodes. So there won't be a She Hulk review for this Friday. So next Friday, we'll actually do uh, two uh, the next two episodes. So with that being said, guys, I hope everyone has a great and safe night. And always until next time, guys. Bye bye.